Hi, uh, welcome to week 11. Uh, the questions for this week uh, were, if you have a student with speech dis with a speech disorder in your classroom who might be difficult to understand when they're speaking, what are, there, what are some ways you can help uh, them participate in your activities? Um, you know, I think that the most important thing for a teacher is to one, be patient, uh, and then also to encourage the student to speak, you know, treat them with the same respect that you would treat a regular student because you know, they still are a student and maybe they're struggling with that, but that doesn't mean that they <clears throat> need to be treated any differently. Um, I think it's really important for like, uh, the teacher to, um, be like closer if, if they're giving out instructions, you know, or, or if they're going to be listening and they have the, the, the student answer a question, you know, be close and listen and listen well, um, and do your best to, to help them and, and accept them, um, you know, use uh, group work and help, you know, maybe have another student um, who the teacher can, you know, trust and to, to be patient with that person and to listen to them and help them out. Um, the que <clears throat> second question is, uh, look up one of the approaches um, in the red um, and then kind of give your initial thoughts. So the, the one that I chose was the uh, ABA um, and it's a type of therapy that imp that takes a certain behavior and then reinforces it with a good behavior. So, for example, if um, a person with autism doesn't, you know, they, they hate having to be told to clean their room, but they also hate taking out the trash more as a chore. Um, instead of telling them, you know, go clean your room, you say, instead of cleaning or taking out the trash, if you go clean your room, you won't have to. And then when they do that, reinforce it with, with positive reinforcement. Um, and over time, um, that will help them to, to replace these, these behaviors with good ones. Uh, it's the leading methodology that's used today. Um, it's most effective if it's used with, uh, children who are uh, between the ages four and five. <clears throat> and I think that it's a, a good way to do it. You know, instead of trying to just correct that one behavior, replacing it with another one, um, uh, I think that's, that's good, probably the best way to do it. Um, and the last question was after reading uh, the 10 things about autism by uh, um, Norberm. It says, share one aspect that stuck out in the reading and why. Um, to me, the sensory perceptions uh, stuck out. Um, I didn't really know that, uh, you know, with the sensory overload, and, and I am writing my paper on autism, so I'm starting to learn this as well, but I, I found it fascinating that you know, with the overload that things can get all like mumbo jumbled, you know, the, the story as they're writing about going to the grocery store and um, the lights, whether it's fluorescent lights that are humming and buzzing or affecting them or the different smells or the sounds or the constant, you know, as a normal, you know, person who isn't affected by autism and doesn't have a sensory overload, it's just something that's completely overlooked by m most people. And when you hear about this and you, you kind of start to think about it, um, it really does make you know, a huge difference. And, and to me, what that caused me to think about was, you know, the school and how, you know, there's the, the, the in-between class bells, the students are in the hallways, everyone's being loud, people talking over intercoms, the fluorescent lights in the school buildings. Um, I just can't imagine how difficult it could be for a student with autism um, in the classroom. Um, so that's all I have for this week. Thank you.